Declaration of Independence, the, the preamble says that there's two forces that will guide the, the leadership of this country. One is natural law and one is God. And it describes them as being opposed to one another, separate from one another. And so we have a country that has come to believe that nature and God are separate. Humans and nature are separate. And for that, we have completely lost our own sovereignty. Dr. Zach Bush and Charles Eisenstein are two of the men that I admire most in this world. Both have radically unique perspectives on our health, on our thriving. Zach Bush coming from a medical perspective that does not even resemble what traditional medicine resembles. And of course, Charles Eisenstein, one of the great philosophers about the myths, the stories, the ways in which we could think about the world in a way that brings about a more beautiful world. To get to sit down with both of them in the same conversation was absolutely magical, and I can't wait to share this podcast with all of you. The truth is, is that we're all the master, we're all the healer, we're all the mystic. Give it up one time for Aubrey Marcus! Charles Eisenstein, Dr. Zach Bush. And uh, when I say doctor about you, it's with a newfound reverence for that term of a complete honoring of the entirety of your ability to bring healing to a human being beyond just the md and i've been able to witness that firsthand mm. over the time that we've spent here so honor you that's a title of, of deep honor not just acknowledgement thank you there's an infinite things that we could discuss us three there's such a quantum multitude of possible ways to go and so i think in charting something of this complexity i like to have a map and while vailana was giving the opening sound bowl meditation it came to me that the map itself could be stan groff's basic perinatal matrices which go from and i'll actually let charles explain it because he wrote about it in his most recent essay and it's something that i've been deeply steeped in and i know as you someone who's been intimately involved in actual birth process i think it's a great map because it applies individually to the psyche of the self and it applies universally as charles has pointed out to where we are as a culture in our own collective birthing into a new reality so charles if you want to start with uh with just a cursory explanation of the map of uh dr groff's basic perinatal matrices one through four yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So he divides the birth process, any birth process into four stages. The first being uterine bliss or the, the stage of, of growth without limit, without apparent limit, where all your needs are provided for. And, you know, there could be bad experiences in the womb, but it's generally like an all providing, all nourishing environment which as growth continues, transitions gradually <clears throat> into a stage, into stage two, which begins with confinement and a feeling of, of the world closing, pressing in on you, <clears throat> and then enters into the contractions before the cervix is opened. So there's a feeling of, of pressure, increasing, increasing, increasing pressure, but no way out. And it corresponds to existential philosophy and no exit and despair there's so each of these stages have psychological components and then <clears throat> and so as it reaches a peak of intolerability with no alternative it transitions to stage three when the cervix opens and the baby begins to to move down the birth canal which on one level is even a more intense experiences titanic forces are bearing down on you but psychologically it's a lot different because you can literally see a light at the end of the tunnel and you know that all of this is bringing you toward a new world you can't imagine what the new world is but you've received hints of it even in stage one <clears throat> stage four then is the emergence into a new world uh, a separation from all that you've known but in ideal circumstances, a reconnection with the mother. And in, in the newfound freedom. 
of this yes. brand new world, a world of light and a world of, yes. of individuation. And an interesting part of, as I've understood it, um, you know, I was very fortunate. My father knew Stan Groff. And so I was, I was brought up with this, this information. And he talks about in stage three, BPM three, that there's a sense of you're fighting for something. Like you finally have something that you know you're fighting for and you see the light and you're fighting for it. And even if you're not fighting as the baby because you're being pushed, you're so inexorably connected to the mother who is fighting, who is pushing, who is breathing, like, you know, full Lamaze, like we're getting, we're getting through this and you in your unity with the mother are participating in this fighting. And if it all goes smoothly, the psychological kind of initial primordial wash of what you understand is plenum bpm1 just the plenum of everything is taken care of collapse hell everything has gone to shit there's no hope then there's hope and then there's a way to fight and you fight together and you make it and you make it through and if you've had interruptions in that it can psychologically have an effect so i'll just briefly tell my story to exemplify this so my mother was a professional tennis player a fighter a great athlete and she was in labor for 12 hours pushing and it was overnight so her doctor main doctor wasn't there so she had another doctor and the doctor was casually paying attention just telling her push keep pushing keep pushing and my mom was pushing and breathing for 12 hours well it turns out that her bones were too tight for my head to come out so it was impossible are you sure your head wasn't too big (laughs) you're right zach (laughs) My head is too big. <laughs> Sorry, mom. I've been telling this story the whole time. I was trying not to say anything. I'm glad that you spoke. It's a very externalized story here. Dang right? it. Like, my head was too this big. Is somehow mom's oh, Sorry, form. mom. <laughs> her, her bones were too small. Hello. My yeah, take was, some responsibility here. God damn it. <laughs> my head was too big. Oh, this changes everything. <laughs> uh all right so my head was too big (laughs) and ultimately we we were stuck and then there had to be an intervention which was finally the doctor woke up and they called him he's like what are you doing his his head can't fit out like c-section like this is not going to work and so i was pulled out into the light so my i've identified that i have this deep like willingness to fight willingness to fight but where i can sometimes lose hope is that i can lose hope that i'll succeed without some massive intervention right like i'm willing to fight but i don't necessarily believe that the fighting will will succeed Mm -hmm. and so this has been something that i've that i've noticed in myself that's like oh yeah i'll fucking fight i'll fight i'll fight to the very last breath i know that about myself but do i think i'm gonna win do i think it's gonna work Mm -hmm. maybe not you know and that's that maybe comes from understand groff's idea it comes from that process so that's an interesting way that it applies individually but of course you know as you can see it can apply collectively or to any birthing process Mm -hmm. yeah i I, i'm excited to hear your thoughts charles but uh i definitely have witnessed a lot of that in the united states in particular the the process towards successful vaginal birth has become more and more challenged with each passing decade of the last, you know, four or five. And the rate at which C-sections are happening globally now is stunning. Uh, in China, for example, it's 51% of all births are by C-section now, which just doesn't calculate that half of births can't be done vaginally, you know, and certainly a lot of that is out of convenience. But a lot of it is also a malnutrition state of mom or, you know, baby or whatever it is. And you end up with a lot of high risk pregnancies in these situations. In the United States, that number is closer to 33% uh, C-section, but it varies a lot by the city. Uh, I think Miami's at 45%, some of the other big cities close behind. And so we have a situation where we've kind of given up on the maternal biology I think in a lot of ways, and that's, I think, indicative of the human spirit in some ways, which is we are starting to give up that hope that you're talking about of like, maybe it's not possible to fight hard enough. Maybe maybe we are just going to have to wait till the pharmaceutical industry or medical technology offers us some other solution. And the result is interesting because at each stage of this kind of giving up of hope for the human 
capacity for life, we tend to take big steps away from nature and we eliminate natural law from our own, almost our very concept of being alive. And we develop some sort of sense of codependence, if not complete dependence upon an external force or an external you know, technological solution. I said something very similar to that in, in the essay that Aubrey was talking about, that the when these C, when when a C section is performed, especially unnecessarily, like in some places it's ninety percent the C section rate. Like the only babies that are born vaginally are kind of by accident. And what happens psychologically, I think, is that the the baby is deprived of this primal triumph that that insinuates into their psyche, I can do this. So it's a, a helplessness that then plays out politically where we're always waiting for something to come and save us, hmm. maybe literally technology or a great leader. And we don't have the, the knowledge of our power. And yeah, I think it's, it's, it's part of the um, paradigm of control that you know, keeps us dependent. And sometimes C-sections are like, you know, in, in your case, like they do. Got a big head. Yeah, <laughs> got a big head. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and in that situation, you know, I think it, there's a different attitude to it, you know, or there's a different spiritual result of a mother who does push and, you know, continues right. to push against an impossible situation. The spirit of that is much different than a situation where you schedule the C-section, you know, a month and a half beforehand and pop in, get your general anesthesia, <laughs> you know, and C-sections are such an interesting thing. I mean, I don't, I don't think most people know what it looks like. It's the most bizarre thing that we do. Like <laughs> in medicine, I never saw a stranger thing. Mm -hmm. And it was my very first rotation because I had done work in the Philippines, thought I was going to engineering took a year off, went to the Philippines, worked with a group of midwives over there and watched vaginal birth after vaginal birth after vaginal birth. These women were by and large completely malnourished. We were working the squats of the Quezon City outside of Manila, literally tens of thousands of, you know, tin shacks pressed together with, you know, mud and open sewage and worst possible conditions really rarely saw really bad outcomes for the babies, you know, from vaginal deliveries and thought I was really good at birthing babies. So went to medical school and when it came time finally to have my clinical rotations, put OBGYN first, was really confident I was just going to ace this thing. And wearing a pager, that dates me right there, I guess, but wearing a pager for the first time as a doctor or medical med student or whatever and goes off on the first day of my rotation and I go rushing down the emergency room with the residents and this woman, African-American woman, has come in. Um, her heart stopped already. They shocked her back and she's hemorrhaging severely, vaginally. She had overdosed on cocaine earlier in the day and so the we had like you know, minutes to get this child out before she died was the concern from cocaine overdose. And so running through the OR doors with this gurney and they do a, a hyper fast, you know, scrub. It was about from crashing through the doors to the baby, meaning you've cut all the way across the woman's abdomen, exposed the, the outside of the the abdominal sheath, cut again all the way through the abdominal muscle sheath, and then open up, find the uterus down there, cut a huge swath across this muscular body of that, that uterus, and then grab the baby. And the whole time was about 96 seconds. It was the fastest, most barbaric looking thing I'd ever imagined seeing. Baby gets pulled out, mom codes a minute and a half later and dies. Baby ends up dying three days later mm -hmm. in massive um, drug withdrawal syndrome. And from that moment forward at Denver General, where I was doing this rotation, I rarely saw a vaginal delivery work. And it was, there's something that sticks with me in that is that we have so pushed away 
from all of the things that would make life work. That woman's lack of support socially, familially, you know, culturally, like we, the C-section rates are just symptomatic of 200 years of marching away from natural law and marching away from human dignity, marching away from our sense of sovereignty. And I believe somehow we actually did that with our founding documents in this country. We, we, we accidentally wrote ourselves out of nature with the definition of nature, you know, saying that we are opposed to nature in the, in the Oxford dictionary. But, uh, I think darker is that, that declaration of independence, the, the preamble says that there's two forces that will guide the, the leadership of this country. One is natural law and one is God. And it describes them as being opposed to one another, separate from one another. And so we have a country that has come to believe that nature and God are separate humans and nature are separate. And for that, we have completely lost our own sovereignty. We don't trust a sovereign concept of God or spirituality, whatever it is. And so I think that we have around us as a society, a long standing disease of not knowing who we are, where we lie within nature. I would take it even back farther than the Declaration of Independence. I think a lot of the reason why um, the C-section rate is so high. Partly it's because of the culturally instilled rejection of the body um, that's been perpetrated upon women, but upon all of us, where the body is seen as, if not an enemy, at least like this foreign entity. Like even the phrase, my body, establishes a relationship of possession, as if my body weren't me. Like mm -hmm. this isn't my body, my, who's my? You know, <laughs> It's me, me. And mm -hmm. to like really accept that mm -hmm. is part of the reacceptance of nature as part of humanity. It's not our environment; it's actually us. It's it's a continuum of relationship. Mm -hmm. And so, like this mind body divide, this body person divide, this human nature divide. Like, yeah, I mean, it's articulated in the Declaration of Independence, but it goes like you can trace this divide widening for hundreds, thousands of years, and, and which points to, like, if the trend is that ancient and that big, it points to the profundity of the revolution, the turning that we are engaging in now. Because, like, we're, we're reversing or transcending a history, a process, or we could say the process is one way to see it, and this is more of a birth metaphor, a process that in the beginning was like, yeah, we're growing in this idea that we're separate from nature, the human realm, it grew and grew and grew without apparent limit. And then over the last few hundred years, it's increasingly pushed up against not only ecological limits, but also psychological limits. Like we're becoming intolerably miserable in this cage of separation. And it's now reaching a culmination or a transition phase where we're moving out of it. The struggle's intensifying, but we don't have the feeling anymore or we're starting not to have the feeling that we're stuck here. There is another world, another paradigm, another reality, another relationship to nature that we're moving toward and it's time to push. Mm -hmm. That was the title of your essay. It's uh, So I was attempting to write a book called Master Your Mind, Master Your Life. It seemed like a natural follow-up to my own The Day Own Your Life. The publisher loved it. And I got to 60,000 words twice and ultimately was like, what the fuck am I doing? Because I recognized that I was still trapped in the Cartesian duality and the duality that says, I think, therefore I am, and putting the priority of who you are on the ego, which thinks the mind itself. And that's if the mind is separate and what defines you as existence, but the mind is inexorable from the body. The body and the mind are actually just the same thing on a different density. And so is the spirit also inexorable from both of those. And so we created this split as we're talking about. And this has been an issue where it's not only the myth of separation between people, but it's the myth of separation between the self, that somehow our soul gets unlocked when this body dies. No, your soul is your body in form. You know, like this is what it is. And when you actually go in, deep, deep, deep in, and you see it, you're like, oh, it's all the same thing. And that all of that collectively is part of the field. 
the collective field of thought of you know the right now we're all in each other's heart fields we're all in each other's thought fields we're on each other's consciousness we're all in it's it's all inexorable we're all inexorable from the world that's around us from the tea that's in our cup from the and this is the thing that i think we've forgotten and as we pursue down this separation individually we're also doing it separately where everything becomes more and more compartmentalized and we've lost our we've lost our way to a certain extent but that ultimately was why those that book you know it won't it won't be written as that because i couldn't i couldn't do it i couldn't effectively separate them enough to actually write anything about mastery it was like oh it's all mind or it's not mind it's 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 one thing it's just different expressions of which and so i think that's a that's a big issue with you know how why we've started to lose the natural laws because animals don't see themselves in that way i think our first nations and our ancestors didn't always see themselves that way and but then we as intellectuals have adopted that steadily more and more absolutely I'm intrigued by this underlying sense that you're explaining that that new, like, twingy kind of feeling like there is something that's never been seen before coming. And it's it's been the first time in my life where I had to start to surrender the mind and start to just trust this weird feeling because <laughs> I have no, there's no way to check this thing. There's no way to go and get any input you know you can't go research the crap out of a future that's never existed you know and so i love the the feeling of that so what what are you feeling like what is that sensory experience for you i <clears throat> quoted carl sagan for the essay sailors on a becalmed sea we sense the stirring of a breeze it's like it's a sea change. It's um, it's like nothing's changed, but everything's changed, and this all oppressive atmosphere of despair, of the futility of the human condition, that says we've tried this before, we've had hope before, nothing's ever really changed. Like, yeah, all that's true. We've tried it before, and nothing really has changed. The human condition, different form, same thing yet something has changed. And I'm not saying that like everybody is feeling the same thing at the same time. This is happening non-linearly, but a lot of people know exactly what I'm talking about. And even having this inner and outer sea change apparent doesn't mean that sometimes I don't go into doubt and despair still and revisit stage two, like the perineal matrix as it plays out in psychology is not so linear. Um, but yeah, it's the feeling of, <clears throat> it's not something I accomplished. You know, what's it like for the fetus when the cervix opens? Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's like awe inspiring. It's a miracle. And this is, it's not all up to us. This is the delusion of the fetus. And maybe it's a necessary delusion, like like the fetus comes out and and he's he or she's like, I did it. Like actually the mother did it. <laughs> but you know, the the experience is I did it. And I guess I'm the feeling is a premonition of that possibility of like like that we haven't done it yet. I mean, this the the birth canal push is just starting. But it's a, yeah, it's a lifting of the futility. And yeah, I can just say, you know, I think you know what I'm talking about. Maybe, maybe I, it's not so present for you in your stage of life, but. No, I feel it very yeah. much. It, it really, it makes me think that part of the problem, the hopelessness that we feel is our disconnection from the mother because we can't do it without the capital M mother. Like we can't do this without earth, just like we can't birth without our mom. Our, our arms are pinned behind us. Well, hopefully, you know, but our arms are pinned behind us. It's not like we have fins on and we're kicking our way out and we're going to swim our way up current and birth ourselves. It's like it requires the mother's, the mother's support and the mother's help. And only people who are tapped in to the mother in a much deeper way, I think, can have 
actual hope against what would be hopeless as just a fetus trying to make this work. But if we know like, no, 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 the mother, the mother is pushing. The mother is pushing and she's got this and we're just going to do our part, you know, and that's, and I think that's an important attribute. That's something that I think defines all of us is a deep gnosis of the mother and a faith in the mother that's unquantifiable because it's not like a literal person, like in a, an actual hospital or in, in a, in, you know, an actual maternal birth process. But when you understand the mother from a metaphysical level and also an earth level, that's when you can start to have faith. Like, all right, like we're birthing and the mother's pushing. And like that changes everything, I think. Yeah, when you were just speaking there, it dawned on me that what we're feeling might be this this new energetic field that's emerging around humanity that, that might be similar to what we see it, with these uh, energy field cameras that we were developed in Russia, but we use them in clinic for mapping the stress environment around within a human body. And so you use the f- 10 finger images, you do a plasma discharge with a voltage char- discharge across the fingertip. And you record that and you see this very coordinated halo around the human once you put all of that data together across the 10 fingers a couple different ways. And they've tracked women who are pregnant and there's always just one field and it's her field. And then the moment that cervix opens, if you re-image her fingers at that point, there's a, a second new energy field. You can see that baby's energy field before it starts dropping into the, the birth canal. And so I wonder if we haven't quite, the cervix opened, we haven't maybe pushed into that canal, but the energy field is palpable now. Like you can, that, that new humanity is there. Mm. And it's, you can feel the potential of life there. Mm-hmm. This is going to require a, a large reevaluation of things that we've taken for granted. And I think that's something that, you know, all of us share in common is that the revolution that we speak of is not, and we talked about this recently on the podcast, it's not a small thing. It's not this side winning over this side. It's a complete upheaval of the way that we look at everything. And we talked about this, the way you categorize viruses, the way you think about cancers, the way you think about a human being, the way you think about each other. It's such a radical, such a radical thing that's going to be necessary for this birth that it's it's no small thing and i think the tension itself like the lobster that the proverbial lobster which is i think literal how the tension of how what causes it to burst out of its shell and get a new shell you know this idea that the tension must build and like this is okay it's okay everybody like this tension that we're feeling this chaos like fuck like sorry it's but it's necessary it's not like we made a wrong turn like this was always necessary and it doesn't excuse it, but it's like, fuck, maybe it was necessary. This is the this is what the birth contractions are on the human level. It's <clears throat> they're expelling us from the world that we've been in. And just as like imagine how different the uh world after birth is for a baby compared to what life was like in the fetus. In the womb. In the womb, you don't breathe you don't eat, you don't see, okay? Like that's, a. I mean, to, to like, what, what's it like not to breathe, to eat, to drink? I mean, like you, be, you become human in a totally different way after you're yeah. born. That is like the change that, that we collectively are gonna experience is at that degree, like that. And so like, like you were saying, like every category that we have to understand reality will change including the categories of disease the categories of money the category of like every category every and every institution built on those categories and i'm not saying it'll change overnight but we are already seeing the future like we can see down the birth canal and by the way like we're not only the baby we're also part of the mother okay Mm -hmm. this don't hold this metaphor too tightly but we can see as the baby is part of the mother too. Yeah. Yeah. So we can see down we can see glimpses of what lies in the future 
And they take the form in the present of pretty much everything we call holistic and alternative. Like that's, and they're, they're only in the very margins of society at this point. Like, you know, the pandemic hits and do we spend, you know, trillions of dollars on um, like, you know, lifestyle changes and nutrition and how do we boost our immunity and resilience? No. Like, do we, do we clean up the water supply? Do we clean up? No. Like we, we, we've doubled down, but, but on the margins, we can see the future and not just in medicine, but of course in, in, you know, how to live, how to grow food, you know, like, like, I mean, we could, we could completely change. I mean, Zach, you do a lot of work with soil, like, you know, like, like without even that much effort, yeah. we could be living in an ecological paradise and have plenty of food. And how far away is that future? It's just a shift of consciousness away. And and so we're seeing little, like in the biodynamic farmers, we're seeing like little previews of what this utterly different an energy medicine. I mean, it, like if I if I even said what it what the future looks like, I would just sound like a nut job. So I I, I mentioned like the more tepid, you know biodynamic agriculture, eco villages or something like that, you know, but really like that just barely begins to communicate how big the transition is. Hmm. Yeah. To true abundance, right? I mean, like the abundance of the abundance of BPM one is complete. It's complete. I mean, obviously the mother can be malnourished or she can take a drug and it can affect you and there can be chaos that can happen, but the abundance is complete. You're you don't need to breathe. You don't need to eat. You don't need to worry about even going to the bathroom. Everything is just happening. It's just a happening that is that is that is the state of being. It's radical abundance that doesn't require your own resources and money. And and I think this is this is a state that we're fighting for in the externalization of it, the accumulation of things and money. But ultimately, the the full cycle is going to be in the radical abundance of the mother. Like that's that's it and that in and of itself is so radical in this world of this is my not only my body but my house my my money my stuff and I, and i get it we're in this stage where that all exists and i'm a part of that and i'm i'm reifying that by my very existence in this and i don't know if not doing that would change anything but nonetheless like we're in this in this stage but ultimately the the abundance that we all crave is a return to abundance where the mother is is the plenum is taking care of us there's like two indigenous prophecies about this time that i just find so intriguing the the achuar the last indigenous people will be contacted actually they contacted us but contacting the industrialized world 1994 they've had this prophecy that in this you know decade that we're in now the wing of the feminine archetype will unfold for the bird of humanity. And for the first time, that single masculine wing, which has been sending us in circles since our beginning, will finally level out and the bird of humanity will fly straight for the first time in history. And so in this way, we don't have to worry that it's like a return to something we forgot. Like it's so new. Like mm. our species has literally never had the potential to do this because we were so detached from the mother. And I, you know, we've got mythology around the fall and all these things. So maybe, maybe something around that is a spiritual truth. Or, but I'm fascinated by the possibility that you're speaking to really is that no matter how hard we try to imagine what that is going to look like when we're finally flying straight, and there's a balance between not the masculine and feminine human, but the masculine and feminine divine, the divinity within us, suddenly stabilizes and. The second one that I find so interesting is that in this decade, we might lose the genetics of fear and guilt. And I think that gets at, the that would be the result of a feminine wing unfolding. Because the masculine archetype is goal-oriented all the time. And the feminine archetype is process-oriented. And so in a species that's always been goal-oriented, short-term, sighted, you know, trying to figure out why it's not working why is it not working why is it not working you know try this try that we suddenly fly straight 
And what would immediately happen is we'd shift from that goal to process oriented, which the result of that would be a loss of scarcity and a gain of abundance in philosophy. And so I think those things might all be tied together that you're talking about is mm -hmm. the masculine and feminine, the mother, this epigenetics of fear and guilt and how it's affected us as a result of that unopposed masculine archetype. And then this, this possibility that we can only limit that future by trying to push forward our historic experience on the future. Let's take the role, just have the audacity to take the role of being a birth doula to the birth of, you know, individuals into this next process and the birth of culture into this next, but really speaking to people. And, you know, I haven't been through the process, but I understand that the role of the birth doula is just, just to support the natural process in its highest form, right? It's like, let me support the natural process of this, support the mother. If they need a kind word, if they need someone to hold their hand, if they need some advice to push, if whatever, the, if they're just there to serve the divine in action, right? So if we were going to just go around and, and act as the birth doula to kind of round the rough edges and the corners and the sharp spots of this to, to help make this smoother, and I know this is a deep part of the work that we're doing, but let's just go towards that of where we find from almost like a triage mindset of like where's the sharpest broken glass in this process that as doulas we can help clean up help round the edges help smooth that glass like it is when you find it washed up on the beach so it's a little softer and it's not going to cut doesn't take away the glass but if if you know and we'll go to both of you um if you're going to be in that what would be your advice to humans at this time to smooth this this radical process yeah, I've, I've, I've had the honor of witnessing four births of my four children, <clears throat> best four moments of my life. <laughs> and a little bit envious of you, Zach, having <laughs> witnessed many, but um, very grateful for those experiences. And I, did, I do think I learned a little bit about what you're saying. Um, I think that the most useful thing I did, besides you know run around and do you know whatever tasks were necessary, was to hold a knowing that uh, that it's okay to trust the process mm. to hold a knowing that yes you can do this even through the moment where the mom says i can't do this like recognizing that that's part of the process too a sacred part of the process and that she can do it and to like hold that it's the same holding that a coach has when he knows that the, my, my coach in high school did this beautifully. Like he knew what I was capable of better than I did <laughs> and held the space for me to do that. And we can source from our knowing that this planet can do it and that each individual person can make this transition, like can be born into who they will be in relation to the new earth. Because it's not just society that changes. It is our, who we are in relation to that society changing in just as profound a way. And so like this cynicism, that's some of the sharp glass. The mm. cynicism, like it, so and so will never change. Is that true? Do you know that's true? What part of you hurts that wants that to be true? And can you also see the part of you that knows that they can make it and dare you dare to step into that and hold that for them with like, not like a, you know, not a shaming, not a push, not, but, but, but like a friendship, you know? That, that I think is how we can be good doulas for this process. Mm. I like that so much. I think that the word that had come to mind for me is certainly related, but the, the concept of judgment, I think is polluting the water so strongly right now for rational thought, rational behavior. We have become in our deep sense of insecurity, we fall back to ego 
the master of judgment, you know, and it's always looking to damn something external. Mom's pelvis is too small, so I can't get out, whatever it is, you know. <laughs> Come on! <laughs> Come on! <laughs> <laughs> By the way, head size is lifelong. <laughs> it's still here. It's just metaphorical now. Fuck. <laughs> but uh, I think that there's a real deep opportunity. The reason for the tenor of the polarization happening right now on the planet is because we're about to lose fear and guilt. We're about to let go of ego as such a constituent of the human experience. And like the birth pains, you have to squeeze the crap out of those last few anchors that you have keeping you inside the womb. You know, And so I really think that the loss of judgment and the understanding that there is not good and evil, there is not right and wrong, there is human experience. And once we finally let go of that strong effort towards externalizing our experience and start to internalize the reality that this is my life, I wrote this thing. <laughs> like I am a sovereign being, an ancient soul that has composed a life that would guide me to my highest potential to contribute something to a humanity that is about to enter a birth canal moment. And we showed up right now. Like there's no way that this is accidental that 7.8 billion souls showed up right now. If it really was the worst of times, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have joined. This is the best of times. This is the best thing that has ever been for humanity. This moment is the best. Everybody wants to be here for this moment. We do not. That's why we have peak population over the next thirty years. Everyone wants to be here. Yeah, it's beautiful. And you've, you know, you've talked about the potential, you know, significance of this moment on not only on our own planetary level, but on a potentially cosmic level. Like this is Earth as an organism participating in. If you have the animistic view, like many of us do earth as a single organism and then part of an ecosystem of different solar systems and planets like this is a very important thing perhaps even beyond beyond what our our purview is and that's i think what i would what i would offer which is a largely you know dovetailing off what you said is it's a place of zooming out to a perspective that can open yourself to a greater level of faith and and support that that and possibility that uh that actually supports what you were saying which is the knowing that it's going to work but the mind does require some way in which it can somehow somehow use a few things that make a little bit of sense and we can get those things it just are all they're not necessary but they're crutches they're like crutches to help us get to the place of knowing that place of belief if we need them and i think when we start to really feel that there is help you know, that one of the things that'll happen is I have a, a couple decks of oracle cards and they're like tarot, but different, you know, written by different authors. And I'll pick some sometimes. And certainly it could be like, um, you know, the, the Barnum fallacy or whatever, where everything sounds true in the moment because they're written in that way. But there's sometimes and most times, honestly, where I pick that random card out of 60 cards and I read it and I go, fuck. And I just start to cry. I'm like, this is not possible that I pulled this one. It's not fucking possible. And like, I feel like this help, like I'm not alone. Like there's support, there's support that we can't name and we can't see. And it happens in synchronicities and it happens in these moments. But as soon as we open ourselves to this possibility, then that faith, then that, and that faith starts to become contagious. You know, that really, that starts to affect the field itself. And everybody starts to believe. And I think if any of us can find that, find that that belief, the gnosis that, all right, we're not alone in this. And you can't materialistically reductionist reduce it to something that you can measure and quantify because it's unquantifiable. You know, like, how do I know that this card is perfect for me right now at this moment? I just know it. I know that to be true. And so I think one thing that can really round that is to have a, a greater faith in the unseen world some way there's many ways to find that but when we find that 
I think that also can really help us believe this, believe this world into existence. Yeah, that's part of what we're being born into, uh, is understanding that we're not the, the sole intelligence and bringer of meaning to the world. But it's not that we are guaranteed to be born into this new world. And it is a possibility. And the knowing that we hold is that it is possible. Mm. Not that we're going to be delivered there. Like the whole concept of delivery even, you know, is, is not. The, the uh, obstetrician that influenced me the most was um, Bradley. Read a mm -hmm. natural childbirth the Bradley way I wrote I read before my first child was born and it just like I was like it was like such it it validated all of the things that I kind of knew but didn't know how to say about and didn't know what to think it was amazing but but and he never said he delivered babies he said he caught babies mm. so it's not like you know this idea of the heroic male doctor originally sorry no no no, <laughs> no nothing personal here but you know no, delivering all those like, problems <laughs> right <laughs> and like you know sucking the baby out with suction or you know like that whole concept you know nothing's going to deliver us from unless maybe we do need a c-section at some point but if that happens then um a cosmic process that you were mentioning will not have been fulfilled mm -hmm. and will need to be tried again. So there's a lot of, and I hope I'm not gonna get like too woo-woo here, but you know, there's one reason why so many extraterrestrial species are so interested in what's happening on Earth now is because it is cosmically significant. That I said that in that story that, yeah. that no planet has ever gone this deep into separation and made it through. And and if if we are able to make it then a new chapter unfolds, you know, in the galaxy or whatever. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's evolutionary. What's happening here is evolutionary. And what makes it um, exciting and, and what makes it, um, what draws our full participation in it is the lack of a guarantee of success. We wouldn't have a game any other way. Right. You know, otherwise it's a movie. I think in some ways we, we just have to keep open hands. It's We know we can feel all the potential. The, the potential can't be taken away. It's always there. But we just have to keep a loose hand on what format that takes. You know? And so it's not like we can fail to expand to that next level. The question at this point really remains is, are we going to do that in the body? Mm -hmm. Because death is not an end point. And if we actually do, you know, seemingly fail to to wake up here and make this transition through the birth canal and we go extinct in the next 60 to 120 years every hospice passage i've ever seen is the most expansive thing i've ever seen yeah it is startling how a few seconds of lucid thought right before death mm -hmm. can break epigenetic and familial patterns of behavior and you, you can see reconciliation happen from this moment of clarity as that soul is stepping across to the other side of the veil, seeing the entire truth, bringing that back for a moment, wakes up from the coma, <laughs> says the truth, dies minutes later. The expansion is so complete on that other side. And I think that it is relevant to the galaxy, to the planet, that we do this in the body. But I also don't hold out a sense of failure for any of it. You know, I think we will have walked the path that will allow for expansion to happen. And if it takes another 4 billion years, it's almost irrelevant in a galactic timeline that knows no time. And so it's so easy to place human metrics of success or failure on this birthing process now. And if we end up with a head too big, stuck on ego, and we can't get out that birth canal, that might be exactly the journey that these nine billion souls by that time need to express themselves in that sudden escape from from the the old paradigm. That's a that's a again the ultimate zoom out, right? Zooming out of time and zooming out of 
this win loss kind of perspective which can give you a deep peace and then what you end up fighting for is you end up fighting for a love of life a love of this life the life that we know a life of smell and taste and touch the life where i can kiss my wife and have a cup of tea with my friends here and my brothers and go out and jump on an obscenely too bouncy trampoline <laughs> and get scared and do these things that are amazing like it's amazing what we have and so yes it's gonna be okay no matter what but fuck it's special right now mm. and the earth is so beautiful you know like what if after some all of the nuclear plants go and there's all this nuclear waste and stuff what if roses never come back on the next time you know what if that that's just like this was their go just like the dinosaurs had their run but like roses are never back again like that's there's a there's a loss and may, and there may be no roses on any other planet probably not because they're a part of this this earth at this time you know just like a triceratops probably this was the only place and the only time that a triceratops existed and by no fault of their own they were gone they had their moment and uh and it's like preserving this beautiful moment this beautiful moment but not holding it so tightly that it's a failure if they go but to me that just means smell the roses like play with the cats like kiss the lovers live like no matter what don't forget to live so that the universe will have this record and this memory that people here on earth they lived they lived if nothing else like if nothing else just live 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 <laughs> live you know Yeah, it's not. And that doesn't come from fear of not making it. Like Zach was saying, that's not what drives it. Yeah. It's the urge to be fully alive. It's intrinsic. It's intrinsic. The very first baby of birth was by accident, alone, <laughs> was by accident. It was in the back of a van rushing through Manila in the middle of the night. A woman had been dropped off at my aunt's front door at 3 o'clock in the morning, and ran. they rang the doorbell and ran. Answered the door, and this woman was hemorrhaging. She was not able to speak. She's nonverbal. She was neurologically handicapped at birth. Had probably never spoken in her life. Uh, severely affected. She's probably in her 20s, had been raped, got pregnant. She had no idea what was going on, no idea what pregnancy would be. Um, we had no idea you know, what her situation was, but I put her in the, the van and I get my aunt's in the front driving to the hospital. I'm sitting next to this woman and uh, I'm applying towels to the whole vaginal area, just trying to keep the bleeding contained. And suddenly watching her stomach, you know, into full contractions. And I pulled the towel away, just trying to figure out, I'm yelling to my aunt, like, I think she might be in labor. I think something's going on. She's like, can you see the cervix, blah, blah, blah. Pull the, pull the towel away. And there's an infant emerging from this woman that's no larger than my hand from head to toe. Uh, blue as blue can be and perfect like it's three o'clock in the morning rushing through so just like slanting light and everything else and it's holding this thing in my hand i had no gloves anything and the feeling of this newborn skin on my hand was unfathomable it was so soft like it couldn't my, i didn't have the sensory detail to pick it up and I was looking at this thing in awe because even though I couldn't quite see it, I could see that every single fingernail, though almost invisible, was perfect. And like that was the level of detail that had been so masterfully designed that it would emerge like this. And I told my aunt, you know, it's not breathing. And she said, it's, it's not going to breathe. Like it's super premature. Like the woman didn't even really look pregnant. 
uh, by the size of the baby, she was probably 23 weeks at the most. And we're cruising. I didn't want to set the baby down. It didn't feel right. So I'm holding this presumably dead baby. And suddenly there's like a weird little movement in my hand. I look down and this thing is taking a breath. And it takes maybe three more breaths, tiny little breaths, but I can feel it like through my whole hand. And I, what it reminded me of is when you had that statement of live, just live. This freaking little thing with a mother who isn't a mother, who doesn't know who she is or where she is or wh- how this all happened. I think it started taking breath and then lets out a scream. That was the tiniest freaking thing you've ever heard. Like maybe if you pictured a baby mouse screaming, but it was so human, completely human in that scream. And it just tore me into shreds. I was just like, could not believe the humanity in this thing that had just emerged so perfectly designed. It was fully there. It was fully alive with that one scream. It was too sm- too quiet for my aunt to hear. I was crying too hard to say anything. And I just, at that point, covered it up to try to keep it warmer in my hand. And we got to the hospital a few minutes later. And we kind of handed off the whole situation uh, in, the, in the short amount of time that was there. I'd, I'd cut the umbilical cord. And the result of that experience, that baby ended up dying a couple of days later, mother ended up surviving. Um, it has left me with this sense of it is intrinsic to the human soul to freaking live. Mm-hmm. Mm. Just as it is intrinsic to the human DNA to make a perfect fingernail. <laughs> you cannot separate the drive for life from the word human. We are freaking drive for life. Mm. And we have freaking persistent you know and so if you look at the you know maybe 10 million years of homo erectus and a couple hundred thousand years of homo sapiens sapiens and all this stuff like there's been some shit go down like you know and whenever i start to get overwhelmed by anything in my life but certainly uh these last couple years my favorite way to decompress my my anxiety is watching world war ii documentaries and there's something about the sound of dropping bombs from a B-52 and those grainy images of the, the, the viewfinder from the bottom of the B-52 of somebody sighting a bomb that reminds me of just how much we have survived. We have tried to bomb the shit out of each other so many times. We have tried to eliminate life so many times. And it just can't be done. Human is the highest form of life drive that we've seen on the planet, I believe. And for that, we have an enormous amount of light. And I think those are probably inseparable. We have so much light within the biology of human that we have that drive for life. And we do have all that <laughs> that drive for life and therefore we have more light. So it's a beautiful like endocrine loop, I think, of mm. the water structure of our biology is so much different than reptile. We literally can hold more white light in the in the water structure of a human cell it's referred to as like this third density and you know a lot of the the animal life and other living forms on the on plants are in this first or second density and so we are this highest life light form on the planet right now and it's interesting that at that last great extinction it, they didn't struggle back they being the mother the father whatever the divine is didn't struggle back to triceratops in fact, we moved from reptiles to avian to mammals to humans. We moved from ferns to flowering flowering plants and deciduous trees. And so there was such an abundance of life that came after the wipeout. And it happens because of the, the effect of the virome. The viruses are the genetic potential of life ahead. Viruses are in a, a data bank of new potential. When there's stress put on an organism, it starts making new variants of its own genetics to find loopholes for adaptation for more biodiversity to occur. So it could be that we are pushing for a much higher life form on the planet 
as a species, and we are currently shedding massive amounts of viruses along with the pigs and the cows that are suffering under our food system and the microbes that we're slaughtering our soil systems with all the herbicides and pesticides. And for all of that existential stress on the planet, we are creating massive new genomic potential on this planet. And there's a possibility we get to stay and play in that new genetic array and see what comes forward. It may be a new version of human, or it could be a leap as big as Triceratops to Aubrey Marcus. It's presuming that tr Aubrey Marcus is superior to a Triceratops, which I'm not quite convinced. No, I, I was sharing that <laughs> concern. <laughs> <sighs> that's a beautiful way to look at it there's a there's a, a deep you know mistrust of the process that we see no stronger place than in medicine it's the war on fucking everything mm -hmm. it's the war on the war on cancer the war on viruses the war on bacteria antibacterial antifungal anti this war on cancer you know, but war on what every everything, and then on the autoimmunity, which is a war of self against self. It's a and then a war of the self that's against the self with the anti autoimmunity. Fucking, it's a it's this war paradigm that is projected externally and internally. And I think from your purview in in medicine, and then from your purview in culture, like seeing how these things are so related as just uh, one aspect of how this paradigm needs to shift. But let's, let's start with, you know, medicine and, and what we're seeing now, which is most prescient now, which is war on, war on virus, war on, you know, and, and the denigration of, dare I say, natural immunity, the forbidden, mm -hmm. the forbidden term, you know? I, I, we could maybe take a finer look at it with using, looking at the word war and recognize it as an anti right and so we are anti-cancer we are anti-vaginal birth because that might be high risk you know we're ultimately as doctors subconsciously trained to be anti-death and that's our fundamental flaw is that we are really pushing hard and we consider that the ultimate failure when we lose a patient and that's so ingrained in us, so much so that certainly Medicare and Medicaid will cut funding if too many people are dying under your operating room environment, whatever it is. So the whole world has told us this is our metric. We're going to not only hold you socially responsible for this, we're also going to economically hold you responsible for keeping everybody alive. And the position of anti has no power within it. You know, it, it can only strengthen the thing you're you're anti <laughs> and so in being anti-death we have strengthened our fear and the, the the death hold that that we are now in with this society that that is expressing itself the way it is the opposite of that is you know being pro-life you know and that verbiage interestingly got co-opted you know politically in this you know abortion or anti-abortion stuff but it was pretty brilliant from a political standpoint to not be anti-abortion but to be pro-life that's a much stronger sentence it's, it has a whole different power to it right and so if we now take this stance of being pro-life as medical practitioners and we go in every morning to figure out how do we foster more life within every patient and redefine life fundamentally different experience yeah, totally because right now i guarantee you we wake up we go to the hospital and we figure out what we have to kill so by buying buying into anti-death we have to kill everything we're killing cancer we're killing it, it, all the bacteria we're trying to kill viruses and so there's this weird phenomenon that happens when you're anti is you actually go start doing the very thing that you're actually thought you were opposed to Farmers are doing exactly the same thing now. Two generations in, they wake up every morning with the daunting task of having to get on a full Tyvek hazmat suit, mix up three to five toxic chemicals because Roundup is not enough anymore because we have so many Roundup resistant weeds throughout the Midwest. So they're cooking up these concoctions of chemicals, full blown respirators, everything else, filling their sprayers, and then driving across hundreds of thousands of acres to spray this toxic milieu into the food that's being produced for the consumer downstream. And they are trying to figure out how to kill every day. 
here's a farmer who for tens of thousands of years was, goal was to grow things whose sole purpose is now to kill things. And so we have so gotten ourselves stuck in this phenomenon of anti-death <laughs> that we are just killing everything and we're killing ourselves for it. The idea of life, this is something that you've talked about and is obviously it was a big part of my, you know, kind of emotional plea is a, it's a reclassification of what life is. Like if we really wanted to just survive forever, we could put ourselves in some sterile, maybe it probably wouldn't even work, but we could try our best to sterilize ourselves in a bubble somewhere and have some life where we had everything was like carefully constructed there was no danger we never drove in a car we never interacted with another person because they might have this we never you could try to do this but you would not be living at all you would just be surviving and i think yeah. this is there needs to be a really a whole different reclassification of life from the all the way from the medical down to the social of like all right what is what is life is it surviving or is it living right and that i call that sacrificing life at the altar of safety which might make sense if you could actually be immortal but you can't there's no such thing like in medicine they talk about saving lives no such thing there's no. postponing death but there's no saving lives and that but but the 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 dream like the ultimate dream of technology is to conquer death i mean futurists even write about it you know immortality and it usually involves kind of some version of what you said like obviously you have to control the environment completely to eliminate any possibility of accident that's considered progress progress equals control the more you can impose it upon the natural world the more advanced you are the better off you are the safer you are and then the other thing would be to arrest the biological processes of aging um and to maybe make up backup copies of your consciousness and eventually run them on a silicon matrix or something like that, which involves a delusion about what the self is, that it is equal to something that we can quantify, that it can be extracted from a web of relationships. Really, what if they ever succeed in doing that, what they will have created is a prison for the psyche, an unbelievable hell. It's the only possibility for the hell that the that the Bible, well, yeah. maybe even not the Bible, but the religion has spoken of. Right. So, so this, so as Zach was saying, like this delusion, this this program of control is actually, ironically, anti life, even as it seeks to stave off death, and it's anti life in the sense you were saying of like not just surviving, but living like being fully alive, like this idea that you can box yourself in, insulate yourself from every relationship, including the relationship with the, with the virome, with, with the genetic plenum and your social relationships. I mean, this is what we're seeing in, in the time of COVID, this reflex of control painted in stark colors before our eyes. Like here's, this is like a future that we've been heading toward more and more isolation more and more control we're, we're being shown it and 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 because the cultural movement toward control is so long and so strong people kind of accept it as inevitable and it's almost like progress that education now happens online and work happens online and everything is happening in your little box and if only we could enforce the perimeters of this box even more tightly then we would be completely safe like that, in order to be alive, you have to risk surviving. Anything, because life wants to grow. Life, life, like you were saying before, like the human being fundamentally strives for life. And the same is true of life as a collective. Earth is becoming more and more alive all the time with each of these evolutions you know the flowering plants for example biodiversity increases and increases and increases and each new species contributes to the collective conditions for even more species to come up and and we're part of that evolution to make earth even more alive and that is more important to life than 
keeping safe and surviving. And I'll just add like one more thing. Everybody recognizes this, this purpose of not only being alive, which is not like, again, not surviving. That's not the highest calling. Any one of us as parents, you're not a parent yet, but, but you have people you love too. Like, like we could be in a situation where without a second thought, we would sacrifice our own survival for that which we love. And our, our children and our lovers, those are representatives of life that are the closest to us that remind us of our love for all life. And, and so like when we speak of like mission, you know, and purpose in, in some of the kind of work that you do, like what is actually that purpose? It's all variants on one thing, which is to serve life and beauty in the mm. world. Mm. And like on some level, we know that that's why we're here. Yeah. Yeah. And this doesn't, all of this talk doesn't mean that there's not the space for prudence. Like safety fourth, third. Yeah. That's, safety, that's, safety third. And it yeah. is third. And it, yeah. that was the Burning Man motto, right. you know, safety third. And it's like, and a great example is, uh, you know, I know a lot of people and I've trained a bit in jujitsu. And one of the risks of rolling in jujitsu, especially nogi, is you could get staff, you know, because it sometimes lives on the mats and sometimes people have it. And it doesn't mean that because there's staff, everybody stops rolling and doing jujitsu. But if homie has staff, he doesn't go to the mats and you don't roll with him. And you wait until those mats have been actually cleaned and an anti, anti staff thing comes across the mats. And that's just prudent. You don't just go rolling around in it because. Yeah, you don't want that personally. You know, it's not like the war to eliminate it from existence in its entirety. Who knows what complex role it might be playing? But nonetheless, prudence says, "All right, homie, you're out for a little bit. Go get that fixed, and maybe even take antibiotics. Probably do. You know, don't allow this thing to to spread and do the thing. Like that's prudent, and let's prudently clean it. But let's we're not stopping the infinite game of jujitsu of the infinite game of of this. And there's a space and a balance for all of these things the prudence of of sometimes being anti and sometimes but still doing that in the spirit of life itself we're doing this so that we can continue to 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 roll continue to play the infinite game of jujitsu constantly trying to find each other in this chess match of 3d limbs and necks and legs and ankles and and that's in the it's in the spirit in the service of a different thing and i think that's where the balance has to come it's like we're in service of life, but sometimes we must choose the anti-path to be in service of life. But we have to recapture that, that balance. And the other thing I, that really came to me is, I remember watching a, a Ray Kurzweil documentary, and he was so desperately trying to you know, find the place where he could transcend death and reconnect with his dead father. And the tragedy of it for me is like, bro, like brother, it's already there. It already exists. You're already immortal and you already have access to your father. Like, and I don't expect you to take my word for it, but it's like, as we were saying in our podcast, like the flat earthers, like pretty soon, you know, for just tens of thousands of dollars, which is a lot of money, I know, but there's going to be thousands and thousands of people going in helium balloons to tour the stratosphere and see the curvature of earth against the black of space oh, that's an optical illusion <laughs> <laughs> but ultimately we're all going to realize like fuck all this struggle to be immortal before we're immortal the whole time you know and then like we can like relax a little bit but what may not be immortal is the ego which is this manifestation of it's an apparition it's an entity that we've generated and that yes we will have to loosen the bounds of that but we are immortal and we are always connected to those that we've lost. And we're also always dying too. And always dying. Like who you are now is different than who you were yesterday. Or, And five-year-old Aubrey is no longer here. No, nope. still had a big yeah. head. Interestingly though, one of the things that we work a lot in clinic around to eliminate disease is to do emotional release work where you actually release your your inner child uh, aspects and so we go through visualization of you in the in the fe fetal state in the womb and you go back to that space you give gratitude to that fetus that ended up being your future self and then you offer that to 
whatever God, you know, the individual embraces, which might just be universe or stars or whatever. And we go through this process from that to remember yourself as young as you can, your first memory, three, five. Picture that child, take that hand, walk around a bit in gratitude, and then let that go. And the speed at which people shift in having let go of these subconscious yeah. aspects of themselves is profound. Mm -hmm. Again and again, blows my mind. And it speaks to this fractured state of the mind of the human which is it's very much what you started with, which was the my body concept. There's no my body. This this is the I am. And if this is the I am, then there really literally is no fetus. There literally is no five-year-old Zach. But the human mind in holding on to those aspects, and we hold on to narratives, right? I held on to a narrative for quite a while of like, why'd you become a doctor? Well, growing up, my mom had some seizure disorder and ended up getting cured of that through prayer and healing. But I w was raised around that, so maybe that's why I became a caretaker and wanted this to happen. Some years back, I realized that is a terrible narrative of like anything. Like That's not at all why I am who I am today. You know, I am right now because I am right now. And it's only by very feeble means that you might concoct some human story about how I am occurs right now. And it certainly has nothing to mm -hmm. do with my mother and her health conditions at the time. And so this is an interesting thing that I think you are absolutely right, that there's only right now. There's never been a more beautiful time to be an I am. But there is going to have to be a letting go of the human minds clinging to the human narrative of who we are. I, my in in the book ultimately what i arrived is that descartes had it backwards and not no slight to him but it's i am therefore i think you know like i am in this in this moment i am and i have this faculty so i i think now for now you know like and that's that's the reversal but the i am is has primacy to all of the other things that we have i am therefore i i can slap my hand i am therefore i can think i am but it's I am, I am first, not something, therefore I am. You know, it's like it, the whole thing has been backwards. And I think it's, as you're saying, time to reverse that and like recognize us as these eternal emanations and expressions of the one, of life, of, with, the, with the highest infinite capital L that stretches up and down and left and all the way till it wraps around infinity entirely. And that's that's it like that's the that's the revolution you know that's one way to look at an aspect of what this revolution is it's not the reduction to the expression of a thing but the recognition of the thing itself inexorable from the whole i'm very intrigued by the possibility of i am therefore i know mm -hmm. instead of the i think i think we are approaching a time where the analytical mind plays less of a role mm -hmm. in our knowingness you know and we start to be able to access the knowledge field directly usually when you know you're you're giving the history of your story about why you became a doctor um and it reminded me that usually when someone asks, why did you do whatever? Even if it's like a mom asking a child, it's an invitation to lie. Mm -hmm. It's an invitation to produce the story that either makes you look good yep. to yourself or to others, to produce the story that fits in with your beliefs about the world. Like, And that process of making an acceptable story is so unconscious <laughs> and instantaneous that we're not aware of it. And the, the, that, but that reflex helps perpetuate the patterns that, that we're stuck in, which is why the, in addition to the I am, therefore I know, there's also, I just want to give um, also a nod to the I don't know, mm -hmm. the mystery of it all, which is actually you know, the, the, these narratives, these stories are a way to try to grab hold 
of the self and to fix reality. It's a kind of a control to, to freeze reality into our categories of understanding. And it's not bad to do that. That's a way to create beauty. But we have to understand that it is temporary and when to let go of it and to step a step deeper into the mystery. When I was talking with uh, Matthias De Stefano, who has a beautiful nine-dimensional cosmology that he, you know, and it, it certainly appears to me comes from a true gnosis, a, a, rem- a remembrance of a truth about his existence on multiple planes. The fourth dimensional reality is the dimension of the infinite now, you know, where the time, where the past and the future, which is a story of the third dimension, that collapses into the infinite space of the now. And this is a place that we can all, we've accessed in moments of samadhi, in moments of, of like, we've found that thing, but we touch it, we touch it and go back, touch it and go back. And we're, we're, not and not everybody ever touches it that moment of like deep presence like deep deep presence deep the deep now and that's what he would call the fourth dimensional reality where the future and the stories about the future and the stories about the past that's all that's all gone all there is is this now it's always now 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 you know Eckhart Tolle this is the entire process of all of the great mystics they talk about this and I think what you were referring to what it reminded me of was what he calls the fifth dimensional the fifth dimensional place which is the knowledge of all possible timelines and just the knowledge of everything com- conclusively in all of the possible ways and that's that's and he has the geometry that that accompanies all of this but there's the now and then there's the, the purview of all of the possible nows that could possibly exist and it is possible and potentially there's entities and beings and maybe we call them angels and maybe we call them guides and maybe we call it channeling and maybe we call it whatever else but there's support from those from those places not only of our and and we have the ability to access that and a lot of times that we that we channel you know Vailana is a great example she's a beautiful conduit of of channeling and one of the insights that she's had as things come through her is that this feels like me in another place talking to me. It's almost very much like the interstellar moment where it was, it was him actually giving himself support from another dimensional existence when he passed the quantum field in the black hole. It's like we're this nine-dimensional being that all of these allies and guides might just be ourself, you know, helping ourselves and when we open ourselves to that possibility. And, you know, but he also, he also said, he was like, listen, in the fifth dimension it's fucking boring he was like it's boring you know everything you know everything everything is known it's very peaceful and in chaos you may think like oh this is good or you may trick your mind into saying oh it's better i'm 5d these 3d peasants you know you might trick yourself but then you're not even close to 5d obviously that's the farthest thing from it but he's saying that in that space all of the 5d beings in this infinite absolute perfect knowledge they're like fuck it let's go back to earth it's like vegas you know like let's let's roll the dice let's live our life let's forget and learn again and figure it out and and play this beautiful game it's like they're like you saying the souls are rushing they're like yeah like i want to go back and I, I don't want the complete knowledge you know so but there is this beauty of being able to access access all of the different dimensional realities and that was really kind of a beautiful way to think about it because i think we have this goal-oriented masculine right wing oriented ah i'm going to progress from this to this to this to this but there's a beauty in the in the challenge and the sways and the up and the down and the cords of despair and and love and happiness and anger and all of these things are all playing this beautiful symphony right here and we get to differentiate the notes so it's not just one om it's like a million different sounds and a million different tones that are all being expressed and it's like yeah the 5d beings are like fuck yeah like that's what, i want some more of that you know the completion is lovely but we could have stayed at the ultimate completion in ninth dimensional or first dimensional unicity or pure void the Tao, which is to me what the ninth dimension is, the thing that's substrate 
of all possibility and then the word the logos the yes the yang the the emanation from the first dimension from singularity the we could have done that but we didn't we collectively as as god we're like nah let's let's play let's and this is that beautiful alan watts piece about dreaming you know we would if we could dream anything and and be anything we would eventually dream to a place where we would forget and remember and and play the game and it, it seems to me that's the that's the beauty of it is being able to access all of the different all of the different dimensions of who we are and not discounting the third that tells stories and says why did you found on it i don't know how many times i fucking answered that question i have a good i have an answer for that but is it the truth like your question about why did you become a doctor or your question about why did you write this essay i don't fucking know it's a story it's a story but like it it just was it was beyond that you know so that's uh i think again the way in which we we put value structures on things and then the spiritual materialism and these ideas it's it's an opportunity for us to loosen our grasp on everything but not necessarily denigrate anything it's like just loosen but not judge and tying that back into your letting go of the knowledge and the unknowing the beauty of the unknowing I'm, i'll probably misquote this a little bit but it's, you know when i think it was christ asked was asked what is faith it is the hope of things yet unseen and i love that sense of it because the word hope is a pregnant word like it's literally got so much potential in it you know it is not a, a it's not a state of being it's a future approaching you know mm-hmm. and so i think that's where the unknowing has to be embraced is that while we are increasingly accessing the knowledge field directly we are enjoying the phenomenon of being third dimensional we signed up for this because we enjoy the temporal mm-hmm. because the temporal gives us this sense of capacity to witness beauty that is very difficult i think in the ninth dimension because everything is singular that singularity you're not able to witness the the sunset in the same way you can in a finite body with a temporal experience with limited sensory neurology but that somehow attributes these phenomenal colors to something that actually has no color at all it's a shift in the electromagnetic field is a solar event you know moves over a horizon there's no color to that but the human third dimensional like simple biology allows for this beauty to be witnessed and that bride of christ kind of concept of we are here to be witness to the Mm -hmm. groom or whatever it is you know Mm. we're here to be witness to the to the cosmic combination of the feminine and masculine archetype right now and as those twist together we will so enjoy the hope of the unknown as it becomes quickening in us and we feel this inevitable new new life about to emerge and we'll get that goosebumpy moment over and over again that will remind us to let go of the fear and the guilt and to reset the epigenetic potential of the species you know it's just we're so on it Mm. so beautiful Mm. i really appreciate I really appreciate you, Zach. Like the uh, the stories that you that you've told us the, about birth and death. Really, um, there's a spirit that rides those stories. It's like it's like the story itself is using you to to speak it and to spread, and they are powerful medicine. And um, I, I also feel. Um, what you have witnessed, <clears throat> even the things you don't speak of, being transmitted in your words. Mm. So, thank you for being faithful to that. Yeah, it's, you've shown us something profound in your work of a- how to access the knowledge field. <clears throat> and the last couple of years, I think, has challenged anybody who has stepped forward to speak in the public view. It's challenged everybody to recheck and reevaluate their sense of truth because a, a dominant narrative has become so so controlled for that it can create that that doubt for a moment of the knowledge that was accessed to, at the beginning of it and so i just honor you for showing us how to stay true 
through kind of that dark night of the soul of reevaluating is this my knowingness is and once you come back to it and you know it know it and you strive forward in that knowing what it's going to create for you in your life and the blowback and mm -hmm. tension you're showing us not only a no access to the knowing you're showing us what conviction looks like and i think yeah. this is something that's lacking from humanity right now as we are so full of judgment and so afraid of judgment that we have no conviction and therefore we are so easily swayed and right. so i appreciate you for showing us something of that attribute yeah yeah thank you for seeing that um yeah the the what gets in the way of conviction is the mortgaging of your capacity to know to some other purpose like being accepted for example <clears throat> so like instead of believing what you know you believe what is socially or psychologically convenient and then but there's always that that sneaking suspicion that i'm full of shit <laughs> i don't know what i'm talking about and <clears throat> to to access what you're calling conviction really depends on working through all of those shadow motivations and necessarily that means letting go of knowing some things especially the ones where you've been right all along you know like you're willing to let go of that like the things that would be embarrassing to admit that maybe that wasn't true after all and boy this kind of reckoning this this offering to people to let go of dearly held narratives about themselves in the world is coming up now this offering and it's such an incredible moment of transformation one thing that you said in the kitchen uh yesterday or i guess it was the day before uh was you just looked at me and smiled and said we've already won we've already won but nonetheless you're out every day talking to people who are farming talking to people who are making the world a better place traveling from here to there doing your spiritual metaphysical physical intellectual work and it, and it doesn't stop and it's it's such with such admiration that you can know that we've already won and still know that you're playing a part that's essential and this is the paradox that you speak of also so eloquently and this is a gift that you've both really given to me as the one who had to be rescued going all the way back to my moment of fight 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 it's not going to fucking work but both of you have said no it's going to work and still we have to give it everything we got and that transmission to me has been like all right okay let's go it's not that we have to give it everything we've got <laughs> it's that that is what is alive yeah it's it's fun it's yeah. it's 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 why we're here yeah and it doesn't even matter if we're going to make it or not and i think it doesn't matter and i think one way to just so people don't walk away thinking i'm working super hard I, I think there was a time where I was and I had a deep sense of responsibility to save the world or my patients or whatever it was. And it killed me again and again to total exhaustion, collapse, loss of friends, family. Like I've, I've been deconstructed plenty of times for working too hard. I am not doing that anymore. And I've realized a far more effective way to usher in the future is I do every day because I am. And I freaking love loving and so I love finding new people in the world, farmers, you know, conscious peoples, the indigenous mindset. Like I'm traveling because I love people mm. and I want to see more of the fractals of beauty within the humanity that I'm part of. And that has totally changed the tenor of everything for me. I do not burn out because I'm fed in love every day. I've learned to shift from kind of this exclusive state of, am I loved, you know, am I giving enough love to this inclusive state of abundance of like, holy shoot, this thing really works. Like the more you just show up in the I am, you will fall in love with everybody around you. 
And when you do that, there is a nurture that starts to happen around you that literally starts to change the genetics of people around you. And so I do not treat anything anymore. I do not go after teaching anymore. I just love more. And it's so, so much more effective mm. because the knowledge field is what the farmer needs. It doesn't need me. I don't, I don't know how to freaking farm, right? Like, you know, I don't have any wisdom to share about human health. Like, it's a freaking miracle. Like, I, what would I know about human health? but I can show you what it feels like. Mm -hmm. And so I think as we step into a new sense of purpose is to be I am, to witness the beauty, which will create the sensation of love and we'll find out great abundance. This podcast ends with this, in the way it began with me, with my blaming the, <laughs> blaming the birth canal of my mother on <laughs> instead of recognizing maybe I have a big head. And in my own conclusive, as we have to wrap this up, in my own conclusive analysis of both of you and what the message was, there was also that subtle way in which I'm still working through this idea that I have to do more. You know, and it comes out even in my speech, even when I don't actually, when I actually agree completely with what you said, but what I expressed was a reflection of an unreconciled aspect that i'm still learning to trust and so thank you both for you know the wisdom from the start and the end and helping me oh yeah oh yeah it's a subtle difference from what i said to what you both said but it, that difference makes all makes all the difference and same same at the beginning so i'm just honored to be able to learn and continue to learn and grow and contribute in any way with uh, with both of you who your brothers to the end Thank you. Thanks for bringing us together. Yep. It's been a long time coming. <laughs> Hopefully uh, it'll happen again. <laughs> it will. Yeah. It will. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We love you. Goodbye. Embrace what you know from direct experience, what you know right now, what you know from having gathered here together. You know something. Can you even put it into words? Maybe not. But it happened. Here we are. Look, you felt things. Those are real. And you'll go back to routines, social surroundings that are at odds with what you have experienced and what you've known here. The more deeply you enter into that, the more it seems like this wasn't real. This is just some games we were playing. I didn't feel those things. I didn't see what I saw. That's gaslighting yourself. The bad news that I'm gonna tell you is that force of will alone is not enough to stop that from happening. You can set the intention, I'm gonna remember. I saw something here, I felt something, I experienced myself in a different way. Something of me was expressed. I saw something of what life is revealed. I'm gonna hold on to that. I'm gonna do a practice around it. If you are able to hold on to it, it may be because you tried hard, but it won't be only because you tried hard. I'm not telling you not to try. But what I'm saying is something else is required to hold on to that. And what I'm talking about actually is to hold on to sanity. Sanity is to believe what you know. It doesn't get any simpler than that. It's real. <laughs> to live as if something that is real is not real, that is insanity. And the bad news is you can't hold on to it through will alone. How do you hold on to it? With a little help from your friends. That's why I say sanity is a group project. You need something to counteract the reinforcing circumstances of the default society in order to stay sane. You have met people here who you trust. They will not betray you. They will not lie to you. When you ask them, is it real? Even if they are in despair, they will be called by your trust into truth because your trust is authentic. The story that we tell about another person, the way that we see another person, is a powerful invitation to them to be that. That's the essence of coaching. It's I see you as who you can be. And I'm not making it up. Even if in a month or two months, you may be again in a place of despair where the reality of this moment is a distant memory. 
even so, you will come back to this. And more. You will come to what this promises. And by sitting a moment in gratitude for it, you establish it more firmly as home base. These three, four days will never happen again. You cannot hold on to them. But something of them is in you. Maybe you have doubts, but at the same time, along with those doubts, you know that it is true. You know that the world can be built on this. You know that there is a future that has sent even its bare shadow, which is already so beautiful, to the present. Staying sane means that you stay in the knowledge of this, that it is true. And I don't think anybody here is going to stay sane. But there's an island of sanity. And to establish it more firmly, take a little more time. Thanks for tuning into this video. Make sure you hit subscribe, follow me at Aubrey Marcus, check out the Aubrey Marcus podcast available everywhere, and leave a comment. Let me know if this video resonated or what else you would like to hear from me in the future. Thank you so much.